so if you're. Yeah, so again, I think this is really, 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 really critical. The. Uh, thinking about. Where the charges go. Where they want to be. Uh, how to rank structures. And how you rank resident structures is all about where the charge is more stable. And that's all about where the charge is more stable and that's all about driving chemistry. So it, it all ties together. So this is really, really central. So if we're thinking about kind of a rank on this. OK. Um, flow. Chart. I think in general. And again, all this needs to be taken. With a caveat that you can always overcompensate a decision with a later decision because it would be nice. It was really straightforward. We'll work through a few more examples and hopefully we can narrow down what those are. Um, but is the charge on the more electronegative atom? If the atoms are in different rows. Are in different are in the same row. So what do I mean by that? Uh, can you get the chart if you have a charge which is stuck on N minus and a charge that is stuck on O minus? Um, that's in the same row. So it's better to have the charge on O my the better to have the O minus than the N minus. OK, if it's a yes. Um, let me rephrase that. I am trying to find exactly the right words because I want to say is is there a difference between which atom and on? Between the most electronegative atoms. So this is taking all resonance into account. You before you can even start this, you need to figure out if there's any resonance where the charge could be stabilized. Because, for example, in the top structure that I've drawn, the charge is not on the more electronegative atom. That's oxygen. Oxygen, the bottom one on the bottom is better than the one on the top. The problem is the one on the top isn't the only way to draw that. I guess there should be an H. Um, I could have drawn it like that, and now suddenly they're both oxygen. So I need to take resonance into account before figuring out which atom it's on. So the atom is the most important. The atom in a row is the most important. So if yes, um, is the less stable charge much more resonance stabilized? So we've gone from nature of the atom to resonance. So even if I have a system where I have a less stable atom holding the charge, if there's enough resonance, notice I'm not putting a number on that, um, should be pretty clear. Like if one of, if one of them is no resonance and one is like a freaking ton of resonance, then the ton of resonance will probably win, even if it's on an atom which is less like to carry the negative charge. Um, If if that's true, if there's a lot, is the, is the less stable charge much more resonance stabilized? Yes. Um, resonance driven. Uh, 
atom driven. So it gets more confusing is if you have the same atom bearing charge in both cases. Then does one have better resin structures? So if the charge is on oxygen in both cases, for example, and one has better resonance structures. Yes. This one. No. So if if you know the resonance structures are about the same, so same atoms, same more or less same resonance structures. Then um, difference in hybridization. This will normally only come up if there are no resonance structures where you really get a difference in hybridization. Uh, because if you have resonance structures, the charge, the charge. The electrons are probably in an sp2 orbital. Uh, sorry, the charge is probably in a p orbital. Uh, but if you don't have any resonance structures, you could have an sp versus an sp3 versus an sp2 orbital, like we saw with the alkyne last class. If there is, um, if the answer is yes. that one, sp better than sp2 better than sp3. It'll never be in a p orbital. If there's no resonance, the lone pair will never go into a p orbital because they only go into a p orbital because there's resonance. If there's no resonance possible, it's going to go into an sp3 orbital because that's lower in energy than a p orbital. And it's more stable. So you only have p orbitals if there's a possibility for resonance or double bond, like double bonds involve resonance. If yes, then look at induction. Um, sorry, if no, can't have a yes on both of them. So if there's no difference in hybridization, then we're down to induction. There's no difference in induction as the same molecule. So at some point here, you should have seen a difference. So what we have here is kind of a ranking of importance. What matters most is the row of the nature of the atom. So row first, then column. So where they are in a row, so oxygen is always going to win over nitrogen, but sulfur is always going to win over oxygen. Sulfur is going to win over nitrogen. It gets conf I won't give you any diagonals going the other way. That kind of gets into the iffy place. But again, in general, row is more important. Which row are you in is the most important. Which column are you in is the second most important. Resonance is the third most important thing. The fourth most important thing is the hybridization of the orbital where the electrons are in. The fifth most important thing is induction. Now, somebody said, well, what uh, brought this up to me in my office hours? My office hours are Tuesday morning, 9 to 10. I just sit there. I am really bored if nobody comes. I'm not. I, I do other things. But I designate that time to answer questions. If it completely gets absolutely crazy and full up, I'll open more office hours. But uh, we're not there yet. Um, and again, Samra is holding one hour sessions after class on Monday and Wednesday on this channel, you just stay on here once I leave and then she'll try and explain things in different ways, which might make more sense. So somebody brought up, well, what about the octet thing? You said, you know, octets are really important for charges. And I go, yeah, I completely agree. That's really up here with the atom thing. If you, all of this stuff basically assumes everything has its full octet. An atom without its full octet is massively unstable. That's normally the worst thing possible. So if you know, in one example, an atom doesn't have its full octet, and the other example it does. Uh, full octet, please, every single time. So let's back up here. Uh, 
So these rules apply whether you're trying to compare two things on different sides of an equilibrium arrow or if you're trying to compare different resonance structures. If you're comparing different resonance structures, you're going to end up down here a lot. Where you're trying to look at relative levels of induction. The one thing I'm going to slide in. Right in here. Is something called hyperconjugation. It's kind of on level with induction. You know what? Actually, what I should probably do, to be honest, to be fair to this whole thing, is I should put the hyperconjugation in a slash with induction. Because they kind of go back and forth. It depends how good the one effect is over the other. There's no rule. That is not the least bit clear over what the hell I just wrote. That is no better. OK, I'm just going to erase the whole word. Um, yeah, resonance always wins if the call if they're in the same column. Uh, it does depend, but for example, um, so Melitza brought up um, what about this column resonance thing? They're kind of depends on what the resonance is and depends where we can do that. So what do I mean by that? Well, Next page, please. OK. So I think we had one example last class. Where we were basically comparing these two species. And this one was more stable. This one has no resonance at all. This has pretty good resonance. Um, this is where it gets a little tricky on that. So maybe I'm going to go back here and I'm going to revise my spread. My if I this thing will respond. So my flow chart is now getting a lot more caveat-y, um, which is unfortunate, but just true. So in general, the row is pretty consistent. Where you are in a row pretty much will dominate over, even if the other guy's got resonance, you'll normally win. But res enough resonance can overcome anything. And so this is why I have sort of a caveat on resonance here. Even if you see a difference, you have to think about which one has better resonance structures because resonance can overcome a lot. And I wish I could put specific numbers on it and enumerate every single example and I can't. Um, we're going to have to practice. So can you go over which of the following valid or which of the following valid are valid resonance structures from the assignment? Yeah, I can. Um, Let me open this up. Should we put that in a, we put that in a, was it a Dropbox or a OneDrive? Um, it was a OneDrive, wasn't it, Samra? Yep, it's, it's OneDrive. Should I send you the link for that? No, no, I've got it here. I, I, I managed to actually fix my, um, my OneDrive a while back. Uh, that is from a different exam, different year. Do we? Do 
Did we delete the questions? Uh, from the Blackboard or the uh, OneDrive? One no, we didn't. I think we didn't put them there yet. Um, but uh, the I have sent you the PowerPoint on the email. Just now? Uh, before I can send it right away. I'm sending it again. OK, so while Samra sends that to me. Um, we can also pull the questions from the Blackboard also. Oh, that's true. Yeah, uh, I could actually look them up on Blackboard. That, that's absolutely true. Any other questions while we fiddle with technology? I'm not seeing any um, resources. Um, for the first one, it's more stable because of residence. Yeah. So although that we have the second like this is in this is down a column. The S minus is more stable than an O minus and S minus isn't stable than two O minus is sharing a charge. OK, I've got it open. OK, so I have a question like this one. Um, so I asked. There are there are many versions of this, but we can go through one because they're all essentially the same. Otherwise, it really wouldn't be a valid assignment. So I was saying which of the following are not uh, are not valid resin structures of this molecule. So I drew. This. OK. So. Um, and then our options on on all of those cases. So what, if you're looking at something like this, remember for things to be a valid resonance structure, they must satisfy. We had a series of conditions a couple of classes ago that we did in lecture. One was uh, they must be valid Lewis dot Lewis structures. So you can't have an invalid Lewis structure. You can't have something that isn't a Lewis structure. All Lewis structures all resonance structures must be valid Lewis structures. And the second thing is you had to be able to get from the starting material from the first one to that structure following the rules of arrow pushing. So if you take a look on all of these, as drawn, none of them is an invalid resonance structure, a Lewis structure. But there's one that is kind of hiding as an invalid Lewis structure, just you have to think about that. So if you think about this, there are hydrogens. If you need to draw them in, you can draw them in. And if it's a valid resonance structure, you haven't moved any atoms, right? You're just moving electrons around. If we look down at this guy down here, there must be hydrogens here. So we've got a few issues with this structure. One is this carbon here is trying to use five orbitals. It's got a double bond, it's got two single bonds, and it's got a negative charge, which must mean it's got a lone pair, because that's what negative charge means. So it's using five orbitals, which isn't allowed. And this guy up here is using three orbitals, which means it must have an empty orbital, which is fine, but if it's got an empty orbital, it has to be charged. It should be plus or minus. It should have either a lone pair or nothing in it, and it's not charged. So this guy down here is not a valid Lewis structure because five orbitals. 
Now, this isn't obviously a problem with any of the others. So this one's not valid. All the other ones can be valid to the structures. There's nothing preventing that. Sorry, I look so washed out. My lights are off and I don't want to get up and turn them on. If so, one of these, because all the answers were two options. So one of the other ones must be invalid. And so what must be happening there is there must be a rule being broken to get to it. We can't get to it using the rules. So if we try using the rules, you can move. Not not being completely unambiguous. There we go. We can move two electrons, so if I do that. I get that. That's a valid resonance structure. It's a valid Lewis structure. And I you got to it using the rules. And then I can do that. Nothing's stopping me doing that. Moving a lone pair into the next one. It's got an empty P orbital to accept the electrons. Everything's good in the world. That's a valid Lewis structure. That's that structure. Now, I can draw this one. So I'm doing, I'm sort of following rule number three that we had, which is you can chain these together. So I'm, you can draw it separately, that's okay. I'm just chaining them together. I get that. That's that. So the other one that is apparently invalid is this one. And if you think about it for a second, you'd realize it because this is CH3. This is CH3. This carbon here is trying to make five bonds. It's trying to make a double bond and three bonds to hydrogen. And if I had caught that earlier, it could have saved me some work. Um, but I didn't. I wrote this question, but I forget what I was writing. So five orbitals. So this one is not valid. So those two aren't valid because either I can't get, I can get to the other two using the rules and their valid Lewis structures, whereas these ones are invalid Lewis structures. Ah, Alyssa, so you asked C, so, um, okay, so Alyssa's put it into the chat. Um, in here, should the bottom left here be negatively charged? Is that what you're asking, Grace? I'll let Grace answer. Ah, well, it's okay to have one hydrogen here. That's fine, because it's making four bonds, right? So it's neutral. Oh, down here, this one. Yes, absolutely. This should also be positive. Like, there's lots of things wrong with this structure. You had lots of ways to tell if this one was wrong. Yes, you're absolutely right. It should be positively charged and it's not, so something is wrong there. You're, you're yeah. absolutely right, Grace. Yeah. Okay, so if I go with Alyssa's example, um, I've just sketched it out. I don't know what the question was. Alyssa, if you uh, actually know it, I'll find it. It's one page down. Okay, so the question was basically very similar. It was an eight membered ring. And Alyssa said she's had trouble with C. OK, this one is a bit tricky. So C is this. And uh, maybe Alyssa marked that as not a valid Lewis structure. Unfortunately, it is a, it's a stupid resonance structure, but it is a valid resonance structure because it is a valid Lewis structure. 
I can get there using the rules. Now it's backwards. And it's going to be overcompensated by the other resonance structure where you push the other the other way, put the positive on the carbon and negative on the oxygen. But you're not breaking any of the rules. It is a valid resonance structure, whereas two of the others are not valid. Um, if I open. If you take a look and say, OK, the, if this I'm going to open Alyssa's. Uh, like if you open up Alyssa's. Um, Show the screen. Ah, chat. Can I just? No, it won't. Let me just write. I just want to write on the damn thing. OK, um, if we if we compare that to what we I just had. I suddenly moved in both B and D. There are double bonds moving where they're not allowed to be moving. Like. This. These two, this carbon here in D and this carbon here in B are both sp3 hybridized. They have two hydrogens. Those are not valid Lewis structures because you're making five bonds on those carbons. OK. Um, Christian said, so uh, with the other one, can I explain why uh, a is more correct than B. I thought a slight positive on oxygen is a no no. So if you open up what Christian just put up, uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Am I sharing my screen? No, I'm. Yes, I am. Okay, good. So we had this compare. I think a lot of people came. If if, if you you can open up, it's in the chat. Um, this comes down to two structures. I'm really happy that it came down to that so many people I think brought it down to these structures. So in A. It was drawn like this. In B. It was drawn like this and it was what is the what do you think best represents the charge density on the following molecules? It's an ester. A major resonance contributor is that. This oxygen is collecting electrons. This oxygen is becoming deficient of electrons. It still has, like it still has electrons, more than carbon, but it has fewer than it wants. It wants more electrons than it's got. So your dipole, on this whole system is going to be kind of like that because both this you can also draw resonance structures from a ketone. This one's also going to be slightly positive. But. Um, this oxygen is electron poor it is not electron rich. It's donating electrons to resonance towards the other guy, so it's short on electrons and so it's going to want to interact. with another ester right below it because this guy's delta negative. So you have a delta positive. Always check resonance. Um, I, I will admit that I think I have a resonance fetish. I get off on resonance. Um, it gets me very excited. I, I will also state that 
uh, reality also has a resonance fetish and gets off on resonance and gets reality really excited. And so a lot of chemistry is driven by charge delocalization and resonance. And so, yeah, I'm focusing a lot on it, but that's because chemistry involves an awful lot of it. And I want to make sure that, you know, as, as we start seeing more complex examples, that this stuff becomes second nature to you. I will admit I do make mistakes on these. So we did. I did make a mistake on uh, one of the assignment questions. We caught it before it affected more than five people because um, somebody said, I don't think any of these are right, and they were right. None of them were right. Um, it was, uh, which question was it? It was ordering. It was some. It was ordering something. I can't. I actually don't remember which one it was now, but it was wrong, and I was really embarrassed. Um, but it didn't affect. Oh, it was which of these questions are aimed? So I'm just going to share my screen here. My other screen. So I believe it was this one, and initially, um, only A and B are amides. But I think the original answer did say A, B, and D. And uh, D is not an amide, and so there was no correct answer because there's a lot of them with like three. Uh, we did correct that before it affected five people, but if you got the example where it said A, B, or D, and you got it wrong, um, it was the same entry, and so we'll see this marked wrong if you can back, get back to correct it. And I think it might have already been auto marked right. Um, that would be good, but uh, I th it, it literally affected five people. We can I can go back and check which five people it affected. So I apologize. Um, there was a single error in here. And I'm going to stop sharing if I can find out how to stop doing it. So we're in a, we're in a textbook we practice residence questions again. I'd, I'd have to look just as much as you would. Um, I think it is chapter two, maybe chapter three. Uh, ask the acid base stuff. You can also just type in resonance into the index. Aha, OK, I'll, you know what? This is this is good. Normally I, don't, I, I like in a normal classroom. I couldn't go over this. We had to go. OK, we had to move on with the content. Flip classroom. We can just go through examples like this, and this is good. Um, and I just need to learn how to show my screen again. <laughs> There we go, share screen, screen. Okay. So we have this example here, so you can see my cursor. So I think the the comment in the chat was, um, how can you show how there's 11, I only counted 10. So this caught a lot of you guys. Okay, so hopefully a lot of you went, okay, I, I know this. There's a dull bond, sp2, sp2, 1, 2, dull bond, 3, 4, dull bond, 5, 6, carbonyl, 7, 8, dull bond, 9, 10. Great, I found all the dull bonds. What am I missing if I do that? And I'm going to close. Um, I don't think I can see the chat and see this at the same time. So Samra, I need you to jump in if you see the right answer coming up in the chat. So if we count the 10 car uh, carbon or the 10 atoms that are involved in double bonds, uh, we don't get the right answer to the number of sp2 atoms in this molecule. Missing next atoms nearby that can be sp2 from nor we got a lot of resonance with question marks. Hybridization and lone pairs from eyesight. Um, yes, but just be why? I, I like the resonance question mark answer more. This oxygen here. You can draw a resonance structure where it uses its lone pairs to make a new carbon and oxygen double bond, moves the electrons onto the oxygen. It's an ester. Esters do resonance. We just saw an example of that with the last thing I just drew. And if it does that, that lone pair must 
be in a p orbital. The lone pair is not in a p orbital. It can't do resonance. So this oxygen here must be sp2. So again, I said this in class, if you have an atom with lone pairs adjacent to an sp2 atom, it too is going to be sp2 because it can make no bond and resonance is always good. So this one can. It's the only example of an atom next to an S any of the other sp2s that is got lone pairs. Like this carbon, it's all carbons next to it. They're fully saturated and nothing you can do. Same thing here. Well, you got another one of these things, but we've already counted these guys. This guy's got a carbon and a carbon. Those are both sp3 hybridized. Can't do anything there. Sp3, sp3, can't do anything there. Sp3, this guy can be either sp2 or sp3. And if it's sp2, it can do resonance. That's more stable. It's sp2. So that's why there's 11. Every single one of the count the number of questions had at least one of those kind of esters or things in it. Um, Tamiflu. Okay, let's see if I can find. There. Okay. Um, so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because the nitrogen has a lone pair and it's adjacent to the carbon yield, so the nitrogen can do this too. So the fact that you have to take the nitrogen into account as well. Oops. It's the same. Uh, I can do over SP LSD, but it's exactly the same question. So again, there's, there's more of them here. So we have this double bond, that's two. We've got six in this ring. Six plus two is eight. Nine, 10. So those are the 10, 11, 12. Those are the freebies. This nitrogen has got lone pairs and is next to an sp2. So this nitrogen will put its lone pairs in a p orbital to do resonance. Uh, 12, that's 13. And this nitrogen is next to two sp2, so it can do the same thing. So that's 14. This nitrogen, it's then tempted to just say it's a nitrogen, it's going to be sp2. This one can't because it's all the atoms it's adjacent to are sp3. So this nitrogen is sp3. But this nitrogen and this nitrogen are both sp2. Um, so Alan said for this question, I counted all the valence electrons to find how many lone pairs there would be. So what you're going to be able to do is normally when you, whenever I draw a structure like this and I'm not sort of saying, hey, assume lone, like like I think there's one question where we do some charges and things. Whenever we're drawing things, if we're not asking specifically Lewis dot structure questions. You assume if there's no charge on the atom that oxygen has two lone pairs, nitrogen has one lone pair. Carbon has zero lone pairs. Fluorine's got three, like halides have three lone pairs. So you can make an assumption based on where they are on the, the which column they're in. So you don't need to count up every single uh, valence electron, every single one. Because you would not have enough time to do that on the test, Alan. And it actually sounds like a really good way to make mistakes because counting is hard. I count to eight. Uh, so Hamza, uh, said, does resonance take precedence over induction or vice versa? Resonance almost always wins over induction. I can't, I can't think of an example where that's not true. Like if I've got, cause the problem with induction is how far away is the induction? So if I have this versus this, much more acidic or much more stable. Let's let's stick with the term stable. Resonance is dominating over a strong inductive effect. If I move this right next to it, a strong CF3 right next to the O minus, I don't think that molecule exists, first of all. That might be more stable. Um, but I'm not that it has to be right there and it, that's the strongest possible inductive group. 
Oh, you can't see the whiteboard. That is a really good point because I am sharing the wrong screen. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, that that really helps. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so Hamza, we have got carboxylic acid versus this. That's the strongest inductive group there is. This carboxylic acid, this resonance wins. That's much better. If I move that strongest inductive group there is right next to it, I think this is more acidic. This is more stable. But if I weaken that at all and still have induction, this one wins again. So in an absolutely extreme case, induction could be more potent than resonance, but only in the most extreme of extreme cases. In every other case, resonance is going to win. Yeah. So I, I think because, yeah. But the extreme cases doesn't normally come up. So it's, it's a much better bet to always be looking for resonance than for induction. Find the difference, generally. OK, um, was there another question? I saw something. Any other specific question? OK, I've got some more examples. So what um, will we do examples of new projections next class? Um, I believe so. I think we're starting to talk about confirmation rotations about bonds on Friday. So what I what I want to just think about here is I want to put a bug in your ear about some stuff <coughs> um, to start considering. So this is kinetics versus thermodynamics on systems. So So let's look at a really simple reaction. Okay, here's a reaction. So I've got two questions maybe for you. The, let's say I put in, you know, one gram of this one, then making numbers up, let's one mole, we'll do one mole. Initially. It's going to convert. Hopefully at this point you're going to go, well, it's mostly going to be the product. And so theoretically we could calculate the number of stuff at equilibrium. So let's say I think it, I think give her it, it's more than this, but let's just put over here. OK. I'm just saying this is this is not the equilibrium concentrations. We could do ice tables, uh, and if that's not bringing back uh, some sort of post-traumatic stress response. Um, 
Uh, Deepashika, yes. He did say that. If the floor, if the CF3 is right attached to the auction, I think it would be stronger. So induction can overcome resonance when it's the most extreme version of induction versus a weak version of resonance. Um, so let's say these are the equilibrium concentrations, equilibrium amounts. What, what feature of the materials determines those equilibrium amounts? Or what physical measurement or physical embodiment of the material? I'm trying, trying to think about what term in physics determines that these things lie that way. I, I'm not asking the question very well, and it's because I have no way to ask this question. So what I want to talk about here is what, what determines the equilibrium to the right. Yeah, absolutely. Conservation of mass. OK, well, that, yeah, yeah, it tells us we didn't create a mass. That's great. Um, but why? So why? Why are they distributed this way, though? Why? Why more to the right and less to the left? And the one answer is, yeah, energy. There we go, energy. The stuff on the right is more stable than the stuff on the left. I'm getting to that, Nora. Thank, you're, you're leading me right into this. Stability or the free energy stuff. Those are the same thing, Deepashika. Stability is the free energy stuff. So this, this ratio here is all about the delta G of the reaction. RxN stands for reaction. I will be using that all the time because writing six letters or seven letters is longer than writing three. Um, this is so this measurement, this ratio of equilibrium things, all of this is this is thermodynamics. That tells us about the energies of materials, like the end states of materials. This ceramic shows that this much energy, the products of this much energy. So after infinite amount of time, I can tell you what the ratio of those two are going to be. Nor came in with exactly what the other thing is, which is kinetics. This is about the speed of the reaction. So if you have, so this is about like exothermic, endothermic reactions. This is an exothermic reaction. I mix acetic acid with sodium uh, hydroxide, it is an exothermic reaction. The reaction will heat up like a lot because there's a lot of energy released because it's going to a more stable product. Does the degree of exothermicity of a reaction directly correlate with the speed of a reaction? Are all really exothermic reactions really fast or really slow? Or are those independent things? Melitza says no. Iocyte says no. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, I said I'm sure I'm butchering it. I'm really sorry. Independent, right? They're independent. Right. All you guys are agreeing. Speed and relative energies of the materials are independent. So we're going to be drawing a lot of things, and this is called a reaction coordinate diagram. Some of you might have seen this before. Some of you might not. The y-axis is energy. The x-axis is something called the reaction coordinate, which is kind of like time, but not really. It tells you how far along the reaction you are. So I'm going to just go back. I'm going to call these together. Starting material SM. Starting material. And I'm going to call these two together the products. Now this reaction is in equilibrium. It is arbitrary which one I call starting materials and products. Like it makes sense here because there's more of the products at equilibrium, but 
I could have flipped them as long as I'm clear of what I'm talking about for equilibrium reactions. So I'm going to draw the starting material on the left hand side. The products are more stable. They are lower in energy than the starting material. And as we go from starting material to products, we go through something called a transition state. This is basically all the physics I know. Um, it's all in this diagram. This difference here is the delta G of the reaction. This is the energy released or gained as you go from starting material to product. This energy here is the activation energy. You can spell it all sorts of different ways. You can say it's the delta G of activation. It is a delta G, it's a Gibbs free energy. This is the energy that the reaction needs to overcome to happen. This determines speed. This determines ratio. They are independent things. We can raise and lower the height of this peak um, without affecting the relative energies of these guys, or I can lower the energy of this product without affecting the height of this peak. Or I could raise the energy of the product without affecting the height of this peak. So, what we have here is a full description of the reaction. So, what is going on? What is this thing? Okay. So, what we can call these guys are obvious. Here we got a single bump. We're going to see ones where we have got lots of bumps. If you think if you're a calculus nerd, um, I'm not. I'm. I'm an organic chemistry nerd, which is a different thing. But what we have at the starting material or the product is we have local minima of your curve. Uh, now it's not, not neatly described by an equation or anything like in calculus, but you can still think of this as a local minima. And here we have a local maximum. Transition states are always the local maximum. Products, starting materials, intermediates are always local minima. Always a valid Lewis structure. Every intermediate, every product, every starting material must be a valid Lewis structure. Never a valid Lewis structure. No transition state is a valid Lewis structure. They're high energy. They want to collapse to a valid Lewis structure, which is an intermediate, but they are not valid Lewis structures in and of themselves. What are they? Well, let's just take a look at the reaction we drew. Then I'm done for the day. I just want to cover this because this is really, 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 really important. And I want to see if it actually helps if we cover it now instead of later in the course. Just the way we think about it. So we drew this. Everything on the left and right is a valid Lewis structure. These are the starting materials. These are the products. The transition state is the transition between the starting materials and the products. So what does that look like? Well, transition state, I'm going to put it in a bracket because I'm saying, hey, this is not a valid Lewis structure, and I am very aware of that. I'm going to put a little cross of Lorraine up there saying, I am aware that this is a transition state. And it's not a valid Lewis structure because we're going to draw something that doesn't make valid Lewis structure sense. We're going to extend out the OH bond. It's weakening. It's not broken and we have a new OH bond being formed. 
We have a partial negative charge on the hydroxyl group. We've got a partial negative charge on the acid. Um, and if you really want to, you can draw a partial positive charge, little one on the hydrogen. The overall charge of this thing is minus one because it's minus one here, minus one here, it has to be minus one up there. So what I've done there is I've drawn a non-valid Lewis structure because hydrogen is kind of making two dotted line bonds. And you, you can't have a dotted lines in a valid Lewis structure because Lewis structures have like single bonds and we know where the, all the electrons are. But here, this hydrogen is making, is breaking its bond with one side and forming its bond with the other. And we've kind of caught it in the middle. This is not a valid Lewis structure. This is the most unstable thing you can do because we have put energy in to break an oxygen hydrogen bond, but we haven't yet gotten the energy out that we get from forming a new oxygen hydrogen bond. So we've kind of had to pay and we haven't been able to get our money back yet. So this is the worst. This is the highest energy point. Either way, it's going to collapse. Either the hydrogen is going to snap back onto that first oxygen or it's going to snap onto the second oxygen. And if you catch the transition state, it's got a 50-50 shot of going either way. It's right at the metastable point. Slight disturbance and it slips back to being to its starting material. A slight disturbance the other way, it slips back to being a product. So you have it at this kind of flat inflection point where it's everything's in equilibrium, but any disturbance and it will collapse out because we're at the local maxima. All transition states are local maxima. All transition states exist for fractions of time, like, you know, femto, less than femtoseconds. They, like, you pass through it because anything will make it not be it. Um, but they're useful, even though they don't really exist because they don't exist for any length of time. They're useful when we think about how reactions go. What pathway does it go through to get from the starting material to the product? It goes through a transition state. A transition state is never a valid Lewis structure. Products, starting materials, and intermediates are always valid Lewis structures. It's 2.30, we're 10 minutes over. I am going to hand this over to Samra, who is going to stay on the line and talk about this stuff or any other stuff you want to talk about um, without me being here. And she will explain things differently if you need things explained differently. Um, just for context, uh, Samra is a new student in my group. She's starting her PhD, but she has taught this stuff herself um, at universities as a professor uh, for years, and so she's super experienced. So what lecture should we have watched for Friday? Um, that's a really good question. I will answer that one. Let me pull up the syllabus documents. Teaching white class syllabus. Um, stop share. Start share. OK. So we've now covered all of this. You should have watched all these videos to do the assignment. We've now covered all of this. We are done this stuff. This is all a lot of actually I think this is like one big lecture. I think there might be two lectures total. It's it kind of overlaps all of this stuff. We are now going to start talking about confirmation. I would take a look at least A and B if they are different lectures. I think they're the same lecture. Um, if you want, you can start watching this one as well. Chair boats and other confirmations, but I think we've got enough to talk about with A and B. So if you're really, really an eager beaver, you can jump ahead to the chair boat stuff. Um, I'm open, but I think we're going to be more getting that to Monday. And Newman projections, again, we're going to be talking that a bit more on Monday, but we might start introducing them next class because I know a lot of you guys are really eager. Um, and the Newman projections fall into these other ones up here. Like that's why there's not hyperlink because it just slides into some of the other discussions. I think it's actually covered in A and B. So if you want to get your bases covered for Friday, Monday and Wednesday next week, because Friday, Monday, and Wednesday are in green. Uh, sorry, wrong green. Friday, Monday, and right green. Friday, Monday, and Wednesday are this stuff about new projections, rotations about bonds, chairs, and boats. So I would take a look at those lectures there. 
get these done and then we can sort of go through different examples of that stuff. OK, I'm going to leave this to Sam right now. So I've already dug into enough of her time.